drugs changed everything. The layer cake is a metaphor for different levels of British society, crime, and this movie is sort of about um, showing how drugs are everywhere. It doesn't matter who or where you are, that you're only one person away from drugs, scoring drugs, or being involved with criminals. You're a smart boy, but you keep very, very bad company. First thing I'd read, which had the the uh, freshness and credibility of what I think Guy has when he writes screenplays. Why don't you come around for breakfast? I'll squeeze some orange juice and grind some coffee, and we can talk about this like adults. How does that sound? Hmm? Sounds very hospitable. Do you know where I live? No. Well, fuck off then. On Lockstock and Snatch, we were always intending to make serious movies, and then the humour had creeped in. So. We thought this would be the one where we, we where we can do more of a crime thriller instead of a geezer gangster cockney movie. I play a drug dealer basically. Well, there's no way two ways about that really. He, he sort of likes to keep himself as low key as possible. He doesn't like mixing with gangsters. He likes to stay away from them because he thinks they'll get him into trouble. Don't take this personally. It's business. He's first and foremost, he's a drug dealer. <laughs> that parcel of pills has got to be worth five million easy. Five pound each, yeah? You are fucking joking. It doesn't work like that. Don't keep fucking saying that to me. He figures, like I suppose a good businessman does, is that, that eventually, you know, you've got to sort of get your money out and you've got to sort of move on to something else. I've got some samples. I'll stay in touch with Gene, okay? So when we meet him in the film, he's absolutely the sort of watershed where he's saying, right, one more big deal and I'm out of here. <laughs> Which is unfortunate that it doesn't work out that way <laughs> because he gets pulled back in. You know why people like you can't leave this business? Because you make too much money for people like me. I think what really drew me to the script initially was the opportunity to work with with Daniel Craig and Ben Whishaw, who's just extraordinary. And, and you know, and, and to have that collaboration of wonderful English actors, I think that's what drew me more than the character. And although the character is, she's fun, it's a lot of fun and very, very bold. Patience. All good things come to those who wait. Mm -hmm. Stay put. Part of me was nervous about playing someone who is that uh, obviously kind of sexual and slightly tarty, but once I got on set, all of all of those worries kind of disappeared because it was such a laugh. I hear you're doing a bit of business with my uncle, the joke. Oh, great. Why don't you tell the whole fucking room? He goes to Amsterdam and he thinks he's going out there to nick a parcel of ecstasy pills. But in actual fact, he goes out there and he's going out there to nick them. We're dealing with the Duke because he has one million ecstasy pills of very high levels of MDMA, OK? One million. And he suddenly realises he's nicked far more than he expected to nick. You no, know, Mr. Duke, you're the first person ever to be foolish enough to try and steal from me. Shut up. But you're not the first adversary to hold against my hand. Shut up, or I'll be the last. Why don't you put it down? Why don't you fucking shut up? Look at you, little girl playing games. She's off her head, is she? Cokehead. I ain't no fucking little girl. Why don't you shut up? As the film goes on, she gets increasingly paranoid. Dude, you are shaking. Fuck off! Increasingly off her face and not sure what's going on, who anyone is. Why don't you are shut you up? Are you I said fuck off, yeah? Put it down. But knows that some people are trying to do her over. <laughs> got these different layers, these different echelons of sort of the crime world, as it were. You want to be so fucking flash if you didn't have him behind you, would you? Hey? Yeah. Well, he fucking has, ain't he? And Gene is a sort of a middle manager. He would be, uh, he sort of, you know, deals with the guys on the ground, but uh, doesn't actually kind of get him involved in anything kind of too messy himself. These pills are going to make a nice fat contribution to my retirement fund. So don't fuck things up again, OK? Matthew's got a lot of experience. We had an awful lot of directing experience, but he's got an awful lot of film experience. He worked it out while we were filming, but he got it, he got it right. 
The great thing about Matthew is that it's it's very obvious from the start that he knows exactly what he wants, and he and he runs a set with that kind of knowledge, with the knowledge of knowing what he wants. So, as an actor, that's a dream. Everyone's expecting the film to be a pile of shit, you know. So um, it's great. Everyone goes in a thinking it'll be another bloody Cockney geezer movie. Secondly, Matthew Vaughan won't know a clue how to direct, so it's going to just be laughable. But uh, people are enjoying this film. Yeah, and um, they're surprised. Cut it! This isn't just another London gangster film. It is THE one. And I think it'll set the benchmark for future gangster films. Welcome to the layer cake, son. Welcome to the layer cake, son. I'm Dave Calhoun, I'm the film editor of Time Out magazine here in London. I'm very proud to welcome Matthew Vaughan and Daniel Craig to the NFT. Hope everyone enjoyed the film. Um, I'm going to ask uh, about 20 minutes of questions with, um, to Matthew and Daniel, then open it up to the audience afterwards. Um, I just want to ask about whether you had any nervousness about moving on from being a producer to being a director and whether you felt at all whether the knives were already out before you even shot your first scene. Um. I was m more nervous about making the decision to direct than actually doing it, and uh, I definitely, I was, exp you know, when you know you're going to probably get shot down in flames, you don't, um, the nerves, you know, you're, if, you're ex if you're expecting the worst, then you don't, you know, the nerves aren't that bad, because um, it's now just surprise and uh, relief that people seem to like it, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big believer once you made your decision, you just got to just go for it, so. How confident did you feel about the technical side of filmmaking? How, did you, did you Very, I've been, I was a really hands-on producer, so that, that side of it was... Um, I mean, I was a little bit nervous with the camera for the first two days, and then I realised it was the same thing as virtually, you know, taking a still photograph, and, and you just got to move it a bit instead. And uh, so, um, yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it and um, felt like I'd found my vocation. As a producer, you're definitely most well known for Lockstock and Snatch, which yeah. are both, I'd say, loosely linked in themes to this film. Were you reticent at all about working within that genre or loosely near that genre as a, as a director as well? Well, I've, I find, um, you know, it's just, it's, England likes to pigeonhole and complain about things quite quickly, and uh, well, the press do, not the people. And um, what I found uh, amazing is, you know, when we make a romantic comedy to people, complain that there might be two or three a month and you know why should gangster films be victimized and you know there's more to the genre than when you know, we say gangster there's so many different examples of you can go Reservoir Dogs all the way to Godfather you know they're totally different movies but they are under the same umbrella and I just felt I could make this in a way that was different to Lock, Stock and Snatch and um, be worthy of um, be, you know, be worthy of making another gangster movie it was worth going to see. Everyone likes to walk through a door marked private. Therefore, have a good reason to be affluent. Well, obviously, I this film's very based on J.J. Connolly's book. Um, yeah, he should know, be here J.J.'s somewhere. here tonight. Are you here, John? Yeah. Where are you? There he is. John's the writer. Both in the film and in the novel as well, your character you get what you see, you get what you read, there's no background at all S socially. You, you are defined by what you do and mm. by, by what your, your chosen career is. And it's exactly the same in the book. There's no explanation of your family background, mm. where you've come from. How did that affect how you approach the character? Um, I, I don't we didn't do an, a great deal of discussion on that. I mean, that what was very important was that we felt that the character should be someone who, um, you know, uh, would be able to mix in any layer of society. I, you know, layer cake, um, and that he should be able to sort of be as anonymous as possible. Uh, I mean, that's the reason he doesn't have a name, um, um, and, and and therefore should be sort of as uh, you know, he's he's a drug dealer, but he he want he's as he says he's a businessman, and he wants to be discreet, and he wants to sort of show 
uh, he doesn't want to sh he doesn't want to make a mark. He wants to do his business and leave without being noticed. Uh, and as far as creating the character, I mean, we did have some discussions. I think at the beginning about I think I mean we did talk about sort of an accent. We talked about sort of maybe placing him somewhere. And then it sort of came down to it, and actually it sort of just seemed to fit right that I should just do it in my own accent. I should just do it as neutral as possible. Um, and then you sort of got that sort of juxtaposition between, you know, the gangsters, the sort of, you know, Jamie, Jamie Former's character who's sort of very sort of on the nose and sort of like, you know, what Jamie does very well in, in, in the film. And you've got him that sort of, I mean, he's called a yuppie, but I don't sort of, sort of it's, I don't sort of see him as sort of a yuppie. He just, he just wants to be, he wants just to sort of move in and out and disappear. Hello. Ambulance, please. 185 Kirby House, King's Cross. There's a dead boy. And the door's open. My name. 185 Kirby House. Did, did you feel with this film that you were taking on a kind of character which you hadn't tackled before? Cause yeah. It, um, <laughs> in, in my way. Um... I don't know because he's probably not. He's not dealing with a huge amount of emotional grief, which is usually the parts I sort of get get to do. <laughs> um, I mean, he does, in fact, deal with a bit of emotional grief. But I mean, he'd, um, no. I mean, I was fascinated. I mean, I was fascinated for a number of reasons. The script was a, a wonderful read, and that's always my my first step. It's the first step of any actor when you when you when you when uh, first contact with the film is the script, and the script was in great shape. And also, I was just really intrigued that Matthew was making this huge step. I mean, it's a huge step for for anybody uh, to sort of make a movie for the first time. But Matthew, with his reputation being a producer and becoming a director, and sort of in my sort of twisted sort of way, I thought, well, actually, that yeah, could be really really interesting and and sort of quite a ride to be around. And this, this is very much your film in terms of. Um your character and your and your performance in it. Um, and I think in, in some ways it's, pr it's pretty fair to say it's the, it's the first film which you're you're, you're, you're very much the lead actor and you're the lead character. Mm -hmm. did, it, did it feel that you had a new responsibility in terms of your role within the film? Yeah, I mean, I was just there. I mean, I, had, I, was, I was, you know, when I was like as a director is your first one in the morning, your last one out, and mm -hmm. I was there all the time. I mean, that's just it's just a heavier work rate, but I don't hear many actors complaining about having to do that. I mean, that's a uh, yeah. You know, no, I the, do. That's the, the time, joy of it. It's the difference between <laughs> us, yeah. Actors normally complain, but Daniel didn't. This fucker killed Jimmy. Oh, Jesus Christ! Why did he do it? He was an infarmer! He was a place infarmer! Well, Matthew, if you could um, tell us something about how you worked with J.J. Connolly. And now, if you could explain, when you first read the book, at what stage... You knew this was going to be something you were going to turn into a film, and how the two of you worked together. Um, well, when I read when I read the book, uh, originally it was going to be for Guy Ritchie to direct, and then um, I haven't read the book for a long time. I haven't read it for about three and a half years. So, um, but I really liked it, and then I, I said to John, John, and we, actually John suggested he should write the screenplay, and um, I said, "You go off and write and draft, and." I'll, we'll take it from there, and it, it came back, and it was a bit. It was 400 pages, so I said, John, we've got to. <laughs> sorry, John, but it was. I said, we've got to uh, just take about a you know 280 out of it, and then we're going to be there. And um, so that's why I didn't have to read the book again because it was all in the script. And and I actually think it sometimes it's best just to throw, you know you're making a movie in the end of the day. So I just threw, I literally thought I'm not going to read the book again. I remember what I liked about it, and then I was going to work on this screenplay until I feel it's a movie worth making. And I had John as my referee to how much I'm, of the book I was forgetting, because I mean John was brilliant in the way he let me sort of I combined a lot of characters into one and cut out some huge sections. And John wrote a lot of really really funny stuff that you know Guy would have kept in, but I didn't feel comfortable with, so I just stamped it all out. Why were you so keen to, to cut the comedy out of the script? Totally. Because I didn't want to make Lock, Stock 3, basically. And I wanted to try and do something. It's more me. This represents what I am. And I think as a director, especially as a first-time director, try and stamp what you're all about onto the, onto the project. Well, Daniel, if you, you can explain something of how the, the two of you worked, worked together on set. I mean, did you, did you feel any sort of responsibility towards Matthew as a first-time director? In terms of helping him along <laughs> no. in any way. Um, um, well, I mean, Matthew did what I think um, all good directors do, which is he sort of allows people to sort of do their, their best. I mean, one of the key factors I think good directors do is they surround themselves with 
with talent um, and then allow that talent to blossom. And Matthew, that's instinctively, I think Matthew did that. So um, it's difficult. I mean, it, you know, sort of once you're filming, once it's up and running, there's no, it, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's just, just a big, this big machine that just sort of has to keep going. And so the enthusiasm you have to keep is sort of, it's, it's, it's a joint venture. The script was great. Uh, we had a great cast. We had a great director, we had a great DOP, we had a great crew, and if you've got that, then you're sort of 90% 90, 90 of the way there anyway, so, um, you know, easy job. You, you said, Matthew, you didn't, you didn't want to make Lock, Stock 3, and it seems like by, by deciding to cast an actor such as Daniel, and also actors such as Michael Gambon in, in this film, you're, you're, you're very much casting against... I'm type. casting actors, which so makes my life a lot easier. In terms yeah. of that kind of genre. And, uh, yeah. Well, no, I didn't want to have, you know, Lock, Stock and Snatch, you know, some people love it, other people didn't like it, because, I mean, Guy was very much into credibility and having the real McCoy, which sort of sometimes drove me nuts when you've got a guy who can't even remember his name, let alone a line. And um, <laughs> so I'm, and I'm not even exaggerating. Um, so having, like, Daniel was a dream for me, because I'd say actually... Can you remember his name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he had no name to remember in this one. Yeah, that's true. Um, but... Um, it, it, you know, I, I just thought if I cast you know the, some of the best actors in England, all I got to do is say action and then cut, and it was like that. They were perfect. I'm Jimmy's old colleague, Eddie Temple. <laughs> Fuck! He told you to locate my daughter, hunt her down like some lost mongrel. Doing a film like Layer Cake is it's not not the sort of film you're, you, you've done before. I mean, what, what's your attitude towards towards the British gangster film as, as a genre? Well, I mean, you know, we've had sort of some fa fantastic examples, but I, mean, I suppose it's like any success always, um, you know, that's one of the problems with the industry at, at its worst is that when there's one success, then it, people send, you know, flogging a dead horse sort of becomes a sort of, you know, um, you know, you sort of just want to sort of try and make as much money out of, the, out of something as possible. So people just repeat and repeat, which is, you know, it's not, I'm not interested in. Um, I know Matthew's not interested in people I, I work with are not interested in doing, but crime stories are, you know, can be f fantastically exciting to watch and make. And I think sort of you look at sort of something like The Long Good Friday or, um, you know, films like that, that sort of sh show London sort of, the, the way we, I think we've managed to show London in this film, sort of on, on, at a very real level, but also to show the beauty of the place. I mean, you know, to sort of use a horrible cliche, but it is, it is one of the major characters in the movie. You, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned London and, and being being a character in the movie. You also mentioned Long Good Friday as well. As well, Matthew, if you can tell me about your what what your ideas were for ha how you wanted to portray London in in the film, and that there's definitely. The way you, you keep coming back to Canary Wharf, and there's, there's several shots from Greenwich right. of, the, of that rising up, and both from, from a distance and from, and from a helicopter, and at one point you're hanging off the building mm. r right there w within it. And wh wh why did you decide to choose that location? And, and was, wh was there, a, in any way, deliberate reference to Long Good Friday? Yeah, lo well, Lockstock and Snatch, in a way, were, I felt they, you know, they felt like they were shot within a square mile of uh, London. You know, it was, it was like we'd cut out a little area and created a cartoon. And um, what inspired me is when I saw Heat, and I was living in LA when it came out. And trust me, LA is not one thing it isn't is a beautiful city. It's got, I mean, it's ugly as hell, and it's sort of like millions of suburbs all connected. And when I saw Heat, I thought, my God, man, man has made LA just look stunning. And, um, and I think London's far more beautiful. So I thought I'm going to show how great London is, and. Um, and just try and show all the, you know, as in layer cake, show all the sort of different layers of London. And um, where uh, Canary Wharf came into it, I mean, originally um, in the book, that the scene is set in Primrose Hill, and they wouldn't let us film there. So uh, it was a blessing, because then I went to um, Greenwich, and I'd never been to Greenwich before. It was like an old area of, of England, you know, you've got GMT and, and the observatory, and then you've got this new modern, Skyline, and um, which again sort of sums up the movie of the, you know the different layers, and um, and it just made me laugh then because it reminded me of um, Bob Hoskins when he was in the which was the Docklands back there, saying one day this is going to be the future, and I sort of then sort of thought well maybe Gambon sort of Hoskins twenty years later if he wasn't killed by the IRA. <laughs> I was wondering what you both think about the um, the approach to violence in the film. I know. You said the other day the film's ended up with a 15 
certificate. Yeah. And in, in terms of the, the world, you set you set the story in and the, the potential for violence. It, you, you could have you could have run and run with it. It could have been a Tarantino style film. Mm. Um, but as, as as it is, you definitely hold back. I mean, there are murders. You know, there are there are killings within the film, but it's not it's not gory and it's not particularly explicit. I wanted the violence to be real. I really wanted like when. Um Morty beats up Freddy. I just thought, let's do it in a way which is, isn't gory, but does make you think oh, that you wouldn't want to be that guy. And um, and with the killing, and I, I, for me, I was, I was more interested in what happens after you kill a man. You know, so I just wanted to build it. That that, that scene for me is more about Daniel or X or whatever he's called, um, trying to get up, to, you know, trying to psych himself up to actually kill someone. And, and I was more interested in him being screwed up afterwards and taking pills. And it was something that we had in common. As soon as I met Daniel, I said, look, I promise you, I do not want this to be a violent film. And Daniel goes, I don't like violent movies. So we, I think it actually broke the ice between us. And then, and it's, I don't know, I, I, I love Tarantino and I, I love a bit of gore, but again, it's not me. As a, you know, as a director, I thought I've got to keep true to myself. So I just pulled the reins. Can you say something about your, your relationship um, on the set with, with Matthew as a director? Mm. See? Can I say something about it? Yeah, could you, if you, if you could explain, <laughs> All right. if you could explain the relationship you had on set? Um, well, it went just very good. I mean, I, th I think we just sort of you, we slotted in. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I mean, I went to see Matthew. We sat down. We had an hour's talk, and Matthew offered me the job, and I, it was a fairly easy decision to, to, to want to. I mean, I was interested, very interested in doing it. And, I think we struck up a relationship then, which was sort of re reliant on, on each other, but also just we just sort of uh, allowed each other. I'm mean, sort of allowing each other to do your job. I mean, and that it's all you can ask, really. And sort of, and also, this film didn't cost a lot of money. It was a very tight schedule. We had an awful lot of work. Normal, normal things about making British movies apply. Um, but I think both of us like hard work. Both of us like that aspect of it. You know. You come away from the end of the day having having sort of worked your ass off, and you and you sort of feel very satisfied, and that's generally how I felt, satisfied and knackered. I mean, you, you say it's a low it's a low budget film, but it's, it's you don't you don't get that sense so much when you're watching well, that's, it. You know, that's in terms of the um, mm -hmm. in terms of the look of it, and I, I imagine a lot of that's got to do with your choice of locations and your lighting and and uh, choices to do with cinematography as well. So, I wonder if you could speak a bit about the look you decided to give the film. Um, I just wanted it to look. Big. I just I, I don't understand when you know this was made for the same budget as most British movies nowadays and um, and I just couldn't understand whenever you watch them they just look like you know kitchen sink dramas even if they're not one and you know it doesn't cost more money to make something look good you just you've got to just think where you're gonna put the camera and, and I mean the one thing we did do is shoot anamorphic and there's everyone's always seems to be terrified of it. I hadn't directed before, so I didn't know what you know, for me shooting anamorphic or 185 I didn't really care. I thought I thought it was stupid when people were saying to me, Oh, you know, it's going to take much longer to figure out how to frame it. The in industry is full of people that always give you a reason why you can't do something, something. And um, and I've learned if you don't listen to them, you normally actually do things much better. I think it looks great. I mean, that's what I'm really proud of it because I. I think it sort of looks like an international movie but keeps its British identity. Uh, do you think that's because, um, is that to do with creative decisions or you, you're talking about where you spend your money or just deciding where, where to put the money and where not to put it and where not to Well, put everything it. went on screen. None of us got paid a penny. I mean, the, so that's where the money went. It was that's up really there. It's a fiver. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we, we shot it with a lot of long, lens, long lenses just to give it depth. and. Um, and Ben, the cameraman, I mean, yeah, he's talented. There's no other way of putting it. And I had to fight for him. Sony wanted me to use a much more experienced DP. And I just, and I just sat with Ben and he had enthusiasm. And that just goes, I think, so much further than experience. Were many members of your team people you'd work with on, on films as a producer? Yeah, a lot, uh, I'd say it's about 60% of my old crew and 40% um, new. That's why I felt confident about doing it. I had my friends around me. And um, and everybody, we all wanted to make the film work because it's sort of it was like when we made Lockstock, everyone just didn't believe in it and, and was like saying it's not going to work and why are you bothering? And when you hear that, it just makes you ten times hungrier to prove everyone wrong. And the whole crew it became, you know, it was a team effort. Filmmaking is a team effort. You know, there's a lot of people that have to make it work. 
Daniel, talking about the, the nature of British cinema, do you, do you feel a particular responsibility to, to British film when you're making choices as to what roles you're, you're going to take? I mean, you have... You, only you, only you, you in the have, sense, have, I'm, example, sense I'm, I'm British, so, yeah. you know, I mean, I, this is home and this is where my heart is and where I like making films. I mean, that's, that's, there's, no, there's no, nothing complicated about it. It's, it's, I mean, the responsibility is... I think we all, everybody who makes movies has a responsibility and it's sort of... Uh, a simple responsibility. I love making movies in this country. Yeah, but it must be a decision you have to make because you have, for example, you have done Road to Perdition, you did do Tomb Raider, mm. and I know that there are possible plans for you to work with Spielberg. So they, these these offers are there for you to work mm. outside of the country. So in America, in America, I'm sure, I'm sure there such is life. There are always going to be offers to work I mean, here. So you, I mean, yeah, but I mean that's I mean that's the sort of hopefully if you're having a good career. I mean, a good career in my mind is being able to do all of those things. Mm. I want everything. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come around for breakfast? I'll squeeze some orange juice and grind some coffee and we can talk about this like adults. How does that sound? Hmm? Sounds very hospitable. Do you know where I live? No. Well, fuck off then. Now, now you've completed your, your first film as a director, How, did you, do you now think of yourself as a producer and a director or are you planning to go on and direct soon? Or? Um, I, I still think I'm a producer. You know, it's, it's hard for me to say I'm a director and... Uh, Let's see how it does. If it does well, I mean, I would love to continue directing. I enjoy, I, at the time of my life, and it was such fun, I can't tell you. So, um, I, you know, to do something that you enjoy, you're, you're a lucky person. It's a very moral film. Um, was it very important to you that the character of X is killed at the end of the film? We had to fight for that ending, but actually it was quite important because I thought there was... I mean, this is not sort of like a this sort of the moral tale in this film, but there is uh, there is something about the fact that you know that he may be the hero of the movie, but he's a criminal, and I, I think we should go away rem rem remembering that, you know. And hopefully, it's uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a tough ending. I mean, I still watch it. I sort of it jars me, but I think that I I like that sort of uh, I you know I like that in films. I like that you know you go away with a a sense of. I don't know, something to talk about. We, we shot, um, originally we shot the ending, um, which will be on the DVD, so... <laughs> this is good, yeah. um, where Sienna and uh, Daniel drive off in a convertible Mercedes into the sunset. That's what, uh, that was in the script, and that's what Sony wanted. And then the ending up there we shot secretly. It wasn't on any of the cool sheets, and we put NG, uh, no, sorry, not good, technically, so that they wouldn't check the rushes. Literally, when I showed them the first cut, they had a heart attack because you know they were, they were. It was that moment where I knew they were going to say, "Well done, this makes sense," and you know they're expecting the glorious sunshine with him in it. And um, they had a heart attack, and they were, they said, "Get rid of that ending. You can't have it." And then we tested it, and and the public seemed to like it, and and the public were all going, "Thank God, it doesn't have a crappy Hollywood ending." My name. If you knew that, you'd be as clever as me. I've got a question, a question for Matthew. Uh, sort of the, when you came to sort of do this film, obviously the success of the film would really rest on the sort of the leading man because most he's in most of the scenes. Yeah. I was wondering um, who you had shortlisted and how you came to choose Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, in the script and in the book, the role's younger, and when we when we started, um, that's true. Getting better. Oh, yeah, no, and um, when we, um, it was the opening, you know, the sequence where he le basically lectures you for eight and a half minutes, and I just thought, could the, would the audience listen to sort of a 27-year-old cocky guy? I thought, no, they won't. I want to make him older. And um, and I, you know, I've always been a fan of Daniels, and uh, the films he's done that I like, he doesn't. But you know, I'm a Tomb Raider fan, <laughs> and uh, so. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I just thought Daniel had it, had it all um, in the sense that he's a fantastic actor, which makes my life a lot easier. And um, and I wanted someone like you know who had the confidence to look like they're doing nothing most of the time with some very good actors. You know, on the set, look like they're trying to steal the scenes half the time. And uh, Daniel just knew what he was doing. And I think uh, you know, I don't. Th would you cast anyone else other than Daniel? Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was lucky. I mean, Daniel was the only guy I sat down with, and and he said yes. So, you know, if he'd said no, then I would have been scraping around trying to find someone. Who, but I don't think there's anybody else who would have done it as well. 
How much was the budget? Uh, uh, four million. Well, if you explain how that compares. I mentioned earlier that you made Lockstock for, for under a million. How does yeah. that compare to the other films you've produced? God, well, yeah, Lockstock was 960 grand. Um, and, but that had a budget of 3.2, and we just didn't have the money, and we went, screw it, we're just going to shoot it anyway, and beg, borrow, and steal, and mm. just get it out there. And we just owed a lot of, you know, we just got a lot of favors and, and owed a lot of people money, then to their amazement, got paid it when it became a hit. And, uh, um, uh, God, I'm trying to think, because the exchange rates moved so much, but in, in um, uh, what's it called? S Snatch, I think. Uh, Snatch was about, <laughs> About six million all in. Um, we had to pay people like Brad and um, swept away was about five and a half, and Me Machine was about two point eight actually. So, but we make things cheaper. If, you know, other people make films for a lot more money. I was going to ask. I mean, do, you, do you still feel like you hold on to an ethos which you which you learned through making films like Lockstock for for that relatively small budget? Yeah, I think it's. I mean the. You know, for me, I learned very quickly: the cheaper you make it, the less people get involved. You know, to Sony, it's it's their catering budget on Spider-Man too, so yeah. they don't they don't care what we're doing. So I'm, I'm I'd rather have the freedom to go off and make a good film, and then you make money off it as well, because you know, so it's it makes sense. Preparation is everything. First, you need a good egg. Toss in a handful of villains. I hate trailers now. I think trailers used to be an art form, and now they've become incredibly sort of, you see the whole movie in a minute and a half. They leave nothing to your imagination. If it's a comedy, you see the best six jokes. And in a way, we're actually taking the piss out of trailers as well. And I just thought, let's just do something where it's irrelevant, or not irrelevant, sorry, irreverent even, um, and a bit of fun. So that was, it was a teaser. You know, we didn't have big movie stars, we didn't have explosions, we didn't have the nece necessary hooks that gets, you know, I'm trying to make, you know, make this film to be commercially successful as well. So I, I just thought, let's just do a campaign which makes people notice it. That's all it's for, because, you know, if you've got Alien versus Predator, Spider-Man 3, and, and a little layer cake in between, uh, no one will talk about it. So at least you're asking me about it, and if you didn't like it, Sorry, but it's, it's got your attention, and that's it's all I wanted to do is you know, get attention. And we have a proper trailer as well, which is far more serious. So, um, you know, I have to you have to sort of con people into the cinema sometimes, and you know, that's my job as a producer. That's I'm talking as a producer now, not as a director. So, it's how difficult was it to put French Connection's <laughs> yeah. name to Cocaine and Ecstasy? Executive producer is Stephen Marks, who's sitting next to the writer, who owns French Connection. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say I had a drug habit, but I thought he wouldn't find it funny. So um, it's because his daughter's here, so it's not true. Um, um, when we wrote the scene, um, again, this was another scene that Sony wanted to cut, and. Um, I, I, but I thought the only thing that would make it have an impact is to have a known brand with cocaine. I think if it's just an, I don't know, some fake brand out there, it's not, it's not as impactful. Um, and I just rang Stephen up, and Stephen actually gave me the book. That's how I found the book. Um, and um, Stephen f put money into Lockstock right at the beginning. He's the only guy that had any faith in us. And um, so it was, uh, Stephen had the balls, basically. And I, and I said, do you mind? Um, us making some FCUK cocaine, ecstasy, LSD, heroin boxes, and um, he actually said yes. And, and then after we did it, I think there was a bit of sweat. And then he's, um, you know, at least it says fuck cocaine as well, which I thought made it a little bit more acceptable. But um, you know, I think it's, it's important because a lot of brands take themselves too seriously and uh, I think French Connection has always been on the edge and they've pushed the boundaries, so they let us do it. I don't think any other company would have had, would have had the nerve to do it. Thank you very much, Matthew, Daniel, and thank you for the film as well. Thank you. <laughs>